Hey guys, it's Coach Sane here, and in this video we're going to be explaining the Flow Control tab in EV3 Classrooms. Now the Flow Control tab, by themselves, these blocks can't do anything. They're the orange tab. Now, with other blocks, this tab, this tab becomes extremely powerful, and we'll be explaining how in this video. Now, the Flow Control tab we're going to cover is going to cover three different types of Flow Control. The first one is loops. Loops simply repeat a line-by-line -line code over and over again. We'll be explaining that in detail. And the next one we're going to cover is if-else statements. Now, if-else statements are simply the decision-making of the robot. So as you can understand, the robot, we want it to do several things during its run. And the ability for the robot to make its own decisions or for us to program decision-making into the robot is going to be quite essential. So that's what if-else statements are gonna do. Now, the final one is weight blocks, and this is the simplest, so we're gonna cover that last. Let's hop over to the computer and see what we can do. Okay, so I've got EV3 Classrooms up and I've got it to the last program that we created in the Motors and Movement video. So just to, re just to recap, this is what the program we made used to look like. We would move straight for 500 degrees and then we'd turn. There's 50 and negative 50 speed, which means one wheel turns forward, one turns backwards, which means it would do a turn on the spot. And it would repeat these two steps four times. Now this is quite a long program and we can simplify this with the control tab. So we'll come over here and this says control. We're gonna call it flow control um, just because it controls the flow as opposed to just control. That's why I prefer the name flow control. So now these here, one, two, and three, these are loops. And what loops do is essentially repeat the steps for a given amount of duration or for any sort of parameter you can think of. So we wanna repeat these two steps four times. That's why we're gonna pick out this first loop here and you can see it says repeat and then it's followed by a number. So we'll just put four in. Now, instead of taking this whole program and putting it in here, we don't need to do that. All we need to do is take two of these blocks. So we'll take those two in. This essentially is the same program that we created last time. And it's much simpler, as you can see. It's made up of two blocks plus one flow control block. And these two blocks are set standard. Your motor should be to B and C and you want to stop once you're braking. So let's remember what this looks like. So as you can see, the flow control tab made this program quite simpler and easier. It didn't change the physical production of the program, but what it did do, it made our lives easier. And it's very powerful in what it can do. Now, this is a very simple example of flow control and in, in specific, the loop operator. So we're going to now pull out this operator. And as you can see, this operator says forever. All it's gonna do is repeat these two steps forever. And you might think, well, what's the significance of that? Like, why would you want the robot to repeat a step over and over and over again? Um, and the answer is, there's a very specific case we're going to cover in the future where we will be using this forever tab. In fact, it's in the next video. So that's the second type of loop. Now, the third type of loop is definitely the most complex. Um, however, it's not that hard to understand. So we'll delete this and we'll delete this. Now, this type of loop, as you can see, it says repeat until, and then there's an empty space. What this empty space is, is the loop exit condition. What this means is that we can actually choose any condition we want to be able to close this loop off. Now, the question becomes what will actually go in this custom loop exit condition? And to explain that, we're going to have to go into a new tab called the operators tab. Now, we actually haven't covered this tab before, but the thing is, we're not gonna to need to create a separate video to control this tab. Um, it's actually quite self-explanatory. However, we'll go over it quickly throughout various videos and you'll pick up how to do it. So, as you can see, the operators tab is green. And one thing I want you guys to realize is that this is in the shape of a hexagon. And this, although it's not a hexagon, these operators will fit perfectly fine within that tab. Whereas the circular ones, they won't actually fit. So this is Scratch trying to tell you the logic of your program uh, isn't working if you're trying to fit a circular one into a hex hexagonal one. So all we're gonna do is cover these seven blocks here. So as you can see, the first one is pick random one to 10. This is not very useful. All it's gonna do is pick a number, random number from one to 10. Um, so as you can understand, there's a one in 10 probability of choosing any one number, but we're not gonna use that block at all in fact. Now the next four are very important. 
So these are what we like to call math blocks. And the reason is because we're going to do math operations with these blocks. So the first one, it's a positive sign. The next one's a negative sign. The third one is a star sign. However, that stands for multiplication. And the last one is a backslash, but that stands for division. So these are the four basic operators you need in maths. And the programs that we're going to create in the future will need a fair bit of maths. Now, the next three we're going to cover are a little bit more complicated, but it's still basic maths. So we have a less than 100 sign, an equal to 100 sign, and greater than 100 sign. So one thing I want to demonstrate is we can actually put any number in this. So we can put 2000, we can put 500, whatever we want. Um, you can't put letters in this though. And the reason is because you can't be less than any number of letters. That doesn't really make sense. So we're going to do math with pure numbers only. That's fairly logical. So just to explain this, this fits in here because we're going to be repeating a certain action until some motor degree rotation or some gyro angle or some variable is going to be less than some number. So let me just repeat that again. This less than, equal to or greater than tab, it's going to be very helpful because what it's going to do is it's going to control a sensor or a motor to go for a certain amount of degrees or whatever that motor or sensor can calculate. So that's all these do. In fact, it's that simple. Like they just, they just calculate something that's equal to, uh, greater than or less than. Okay, so now let's head back to the flow control tab. And we were discussing this one here, this repeat until, and it's a blank space. So I'm gonna call this a custom loop exit condition. So we're now going to do an example of a custom look at loop exit condition to demonstrate what it can do. And it's actually quite simple. So I'm gonna go down to the operators tab and I'm gonna pull out a greater than block. So for the time being, all I'm gonna do is gonna change this to 650. Right now, this isn't gonna make any sense because nothing is greater than 650. We have to plug something in there. And if you remember back into the motors tab, we discussed this block very quickly. All this block does is it calculates the degrees that the wheels have calculated. So if it's rotated for 360 degrees, this block will pick up that 360 degrees. So we're gonna plug this block into that circle there. And now this is starting to make a little bit more sense. So we're going to repeat some program which we haven't plugged in yet. Uh, we're gonna repeat that program until motor B has calculated 650 degrees. So all that's gonna do is that's waiting for the robot to go forward. So the last thing we're going to do to complete this program and explain what this custom loop exit condition can do is we're going to pull out a block from here and it's going to be start moving at 50 50 speed. So let's see what this program looks like. Okay, so let's explain what that program actually did. So it's quite a simple program. In fact, it's nothing different from what we've learned. All it did was it started the robot moving at 50 50 speed, which means the robot's wheels went forward for 50 and 50 speed, and it only stopped until motor B calculated a rotation of greater than 650 degrees. That's when it knows when to stop. So it's just a basic move straight forward. You might be thinking, how is that different to this block here? Because all this will do is if we change that to degrees and 650, that will do the exact same thing. Now, yes, you're correct. This, in fact, is a much simpler program to this one. However, I just used this condition here to explain the power of a loop. It'll repeat something for a given amount of time, and we don't necessarily have to use degrees counted. In future videos when we discuss sensors, we'll see how sensors are actually controlled by flow control. So just understand that this condition will move or repeat a block for a certain amount of time for a certain duration. And in this example, we moved our wheels forward until motor B calculated a number greater than 650. It's that simple. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to explain how to move your robot backwards. So it's just a simple, all we have to do is change this to negative and negative. But one more thing we have to account for is this loop control here. Now this is where things might get a little bit complicated with the math, but if you bear with me, it should be fine. So we're going to move the robot backwards. Now, when the robot moves backwards, it's calculating a negative number, right? So what that means is that motor B is going to be less than a negative number. It's never gonna be greater than 650. So what we're gonna to have to do is change this condition here inside. So instead of using greater than 650, all we have to do is grab this one, plug that back in, 
and choose less than negative 650. So what that's going to do is going to move the robot backwards at 50-50 speed and then it's only going to stop once it's less than negative 650 degrees. Now if you didn't change this and you went back to this program here, all that's going to do is it won't do anything. Um, the reason being because the robot will never become greater than 650 degrees if it's going backwards. It'll just repeat this negative over and over and over again and it won't stop, which is not what we wanted. So let's see what this program looks like and see if it works. Okay, awesome. So that's loops in a nutshell. Just to quickly go over it, there's three types of loops we quickly went over. So the first one was a repeat for a number of times and we used the square example to show this. So we repeated the straight and the turn four times to create that square in a much simpler program. Now the next one we explained and we brushed over this very quickly was this forever tab. All this is going to do is repeat uh, an instruction forever. And we'll see examples of this in future videos, however you don't really need to understand this at the moment. Just understand that it's just going to repeat an instruction or a block over and over and over again forever. Now the last one we explained and indefinitely the most important one is this custom loop exit block. Now I only showed you one example of this, we'll be going over various examples. So if at the moment this custom loop exit block doesn't really make too much sense, it's okay. Hopefully over the next few videos your understanding will become solidified. So just to explain what it does, it'll repeat an instruction for a given amount of time or for whatever parameter we want. So in this example we chose a degrees counted parameter, which means it'll go forward until degrees counted is greater than or less than a certain number. In future videos we'll be going over things like how to use the gyro to calculate angles, also how to use light values to calculate the black and white lines. However at this point you don't need to know that, just understand that this loop exit block can control a certain action for any parameter we want and that's quite powerful. Okay great, so that's loops in a nutshell. The next thing we're going to discuss is this if else statements here. So there are two types of statements here, there's this one here which is just if and then a blank box and then some space here where we can program and the next one is if a blank box and then another two different boxes where we can apply things so the first one is much simpler so we'll explain that first and once you understand that the next one will become quite intuitive so what we're going to want to do is just to explain this i'll get i'll pull out a forever block here and then i'll put this loop here so all this loop does is it asks a question it asks the robot a question, if something happens, then I'm going to do something else. This is what we call decision making, and it's going to be essential for our robot. So I'm going to show you an example of this, and it's going to be quite a simple example. We haven't discussed this block, but it's a very simple block to understand. So we're going to go down to the census block, and I'm going to pull out this one here. So all this is, is this is the brick here. And all this brick is going to do is ask the question of if this center button is pressed. So this center button is actually like a sensor, it's in fact like a touch sensor. So when you touch it, something will happen. As you can see, it's turning on, which was a mistake, but that's fine. So now moving on, the question is, if the center button is pressed, what do we want to do? And just for this example, I'm going to pull out a very simple block. I'm going to say, if the center button is pressed, I'm going to want to move forward for negative 600 degrees at 40 and 40 speed. So let's plug that all in. So what this is going to do is it's going to make the robot to create a decision. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so as you can see, it's quite simple. When we started the program, the robot didn't do anything. But once we touch that middle button, that's when the robot actually moved forward for negative 600 degrees. And this is the robot making a decision. Now this decision was impacted by us, sure, because we had to touch the button. However, in future videos, we're going to use sensors to be able to let the robot make its own decisions, which is quite powerful. This is why this if statement is very important. In fact, the whole control tab, or the flow control tab, as I like to say, is the most important tab in EV3 classrooms, hands down, because it allows you to do some incredible things with the robot. Now you might be asking, why is this if statement in a forever loop? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what happens here. So if this was a question that you had to ask, like what's the point of putting it in the forever loop? Why can't you just ask the question and then let the robot run, right? What's the point of this forever loop? 
Well, this is where an understanding of the robot and how the robot works is essential. So if I was to run this program, this question is only asked once, right? Because that's what the block by block, a line by line code means. So it's gonna set up its BNC, it's gonna hold its stop, and then it's gonna ask the question, is the center button pressed? And obviously, if we haven't pressed that at all, then it's gonna respond to that and say no, which means it's just gonna end its program there. That's why we need to put this in this forever loop, because we need to continuously ask the question, is the robot, the center button of the robot pressed? And that's why we use this forever loop, because this question needs to be continuously asked. Um, this sort of understanding is quite essential. So if you don't understand that, you can just watch my explanation again. So um, it's quite important. We're gonna be using this forever loop um, in this scenario quite often. Okay, so the last thing we're gonna discuss for if and else statements is this one here. So the first part of this is exactly the same as what we learned. So if something happens, then we're going to do something. So I can just plug this back in here and plug that back in there. But now you, are, now you see that there's another sort of case here and it's else. What do we do if this condition isn't met? And for this, it's very uh, important to think like the robot. So if the center button is pressed, then we're going to move forward for negative 600 degrees. If you're the robot and you ask the question, if it is pressed, the question is for else is what happens when it's not pressed? And most of the time we're not gonna press the robot. So just to show what's gonna happen, I'm going to pull out a negative 20 and 20 block. So let's pull this out here. In fact, let's do this one here. So start moving at negative 20 and 20. <coughs> and then let's pull this if out and let's delete that. And let's plug this in here. So let's explain what's gonna happen. So forget this forever loop, right? We'll explain that later. It's gonna ask the question, is the center button pressed? If the center button is pressed, then we're gonna move forward for negative 600 degrees. We've been doing that for the past, that's quite simple. Now, if the center button isn't pressed, then we're going to move one wheel backwards for negative 20 power and one wheel forward for negative 20 power. What's that, what is that gonna do? That's gonna cause the robot to continuously turn. And there's no fixed duration here, which means it'll continuously turn. Once we press that center button, then it's gonna move forward. And then once the center button isn't pressed, it's gonna continuously turn again, and so on and so forth. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so as you can see, that's what this program did. Um, and essentially, it's the decision making of the robot, but now we give the robot two cases, right? So if something happens, then we're gonna do something. If that something doesn't happen, then we're going to do something else. So we have two cases in this scenario. Now, if you're thinking like a programmer, the question might be, so how do we create more cases than that, right? So you can think about it like an example of your own. It's sort of like if you are hungry, then I want to make a certain amount of things, right? So I can either have pasta, I can have rice and eggs, I can have certain amount of cases. So we don't necessarily have two cases in real life. And in fact, the robot doesn't necessarily need to do two things. If you want to create more cases for the robot, all you have to do is create an if else nested loop. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to put it in here. And this is where things might get a little bit hazy but it's okay because we're gonna, this situation here is quite rare. So if you don't understand this, once again, it's completely fine. So if the center button is pressed, we have the option to do something. If it's not pressed, we have another condition here, right? And this condition is going to give us another brand new two cases. And you can keep going, right? So this, is, this has created three cases for us. If we go again and we put this in here, we now have one, two, three, four cases. So every time we add another if else loop, we create one more case. And that's essentially how you create cases within cases. And just to explain again, this is called a nested if else statement. It's not gonna be very important to us at this stage. However, later on, it might become important. So if you do understand it, that's very good. If you don't, it's okay. You can rewatch this video, try and understand it. Comment below, see if, if you have any troubles, let me know. 
and I can try to get back to you with that. Okay, so that was essentially if and else statements in a nutshell. There were only two, so let's quickly recap just to make sure we understand what's going on. So the first one we discussed was a simple if statement. If something happens, then we're going to do something else. And the next one we discussed was if something happens, then we're going to do something. But if that something does not happen, so if the opposite of that is true, then we're going to do something else. And finally, we discussed if else statements nested, which means we can create more cases for us to do more things. So that's if else statements in a nutshell. Okay, so at the start of the video, we discussed there were three types of flow control tabs we were going to discuss. The first one was loops, which we covered. The next one was if else statements, which we also covered. And the last one and the simplest one out of all of these are weight blocks. Now there are two types of weight blocks we're going to discuss and I'm going to show this through an example. So weight blocks, all they do is they make the robot wait for a certain amount of time or until an action has happened. So there are two scenarios where we're going to use this. The first one is time. So if we want to move forward and we want to wait for two seconds before the robot does something else. So we're going to pull out a straight block. So let's move forward for negative 500 degrees at 40 and 40 speed. So let's plug that all in, negative 500 at 40 and 40 speed. All this block is going to do is it makes the robot go straight. We discussed this in the first video. Now, the next thing we're going to do is go here and explain what this block is going to do. So if you go to the control tab, we're going to use this block here and it says wait for a number of seconds and we're going to choose two. Quite intuitively, all this means is that we're going to move forward. We're then going to wait two seconds. It's just line by line, block by block code. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to want to turn for 190 degrees. So let's pull that out, change that to degrees, 190. And once again, a turn on the spot means one wheel is negative, one wheel is positive. So let's just make this one negative. It doesn't really matter which way we're turning. And let's see what this program looks like. So just to recap, all this did was it moved straight. It then waited for two seconds. If you want, you can go back and check that it waited for two seconds, but it did. And then it turned. You might be asking, what's the significance of this, right? Why are we wasting time just to turn? And the answer is sometimes when we have completely complex programs, it's important to give the robot a bit of a break to make sure it's running the right programs. I know that sounds a little bit silly because robots should do what we tell them, but in fact, that's not exactly what happens. Robots can make mistakes too. And there are natural errors that are created when the robot moves forward very fast. That's why sometimes we want to stop, make, let the robot sit for a little bit, make sure it's calculating the right number of degrees and angles, and it will correct itself if necessary, and then do the turn. So this wait for two seconds, it might seem useless at this stage. Once we get into very deep and complex programming, you're going to want to see that you're going to want to wait. So that's essentially the timer, right? Um, there's nothing too special going on here. It just waits for a number of seconds. So the next book we're going to discuss is another wait tab. However, it's a little bit different. It's in the census operator here. Even though it's technically flow control, it's in the census tab because it uses a brick button. So what I'm going to want to do is pull that out and then push this back in here and let's delete this brick time here. So let's read this program, right? It'll move forward for negative 500 degrees. We've seen that. It's then going to wait until the center button is pressed. Once that center button is pressed, then we're going to want to do the turn. This is different to the decision-making program we created at the start. The reason being is because we're actually going to want the robot to wait and we're going to intervene while the robot is running its program. So in the past, we programmed a wait within our initial start. So we started it, we let it wait, and then we, it did its thing. However, now we're going to want it to stop mid-program, and then we're going to want to press the button, and then we're going to let it turn. Once again, this might seem completely redundant, because in a robot game, especially for FLL, you're technically not allowed to touch the robot. So why are we doing this here? The main reason for this is to debug programs. So if you have complex programs that are line by line and step by step, you don't want to run all of them. Sometimes you just want to see what one block does. That's why if we want to see if this block goes forward for enough degrees, we'll wait. And we'll wait until the center button is pressed because then we can analyze if the robot went far enough. If that's true, then we're going to press the button and move forward to the next block. So you're going to want to delete all of these wait blocks once you're in the robot game because they're just going to ruin your programs and you're going to they're going to cost you precision points. So instead, this is just for debugging your program and making sure there are no errors. Let's see what this program looks like.
And that's essentially all there is to the flow control tab. So lastly, we discussed two timers, right? We discussed a timer that relied on seconds and we discussed another weight that relied on brick buttons and us pressing the center button. It wasn't too difficult with the last two blocks. However, I will quickly recover this first three flow control tabs. So this first three, they're loops, right? This one will repeat for a number of durations. So we did the square example, we repeated it four times. This forever, it is quite essential. However, it's a bit more in the backdrop. So all it will do is it will repeat a program forever and ever. And we use this to repeat the question that we're going to ask, which was explained here. So our last one is a repeat until, and we call this a custom loop tab because we can repeat an instruction for whatever parameter we want. If we want, we use the motor rotations and we repeat an instruction for a certain amount of motor rotations. The next one we discussed was this if and then tab. So this if, it asks the question, if something happens, then something else will happen. And naturally you might be thinking, okay, what's the next case? If something happens, then something happens. However, if that initial something didn't happen, then we want something else to happen. That's what we call an if else tab. So we're gonna call this an if block and we're gonna call this an if else block. And finally, we also discussed how to create multiple cases. So if you wanna do three things, then you nest an if else block within an if else block. That might sound a bit complicated, but it's okay. Um, hopefully with a bit of practice, it'll become a lot more logical. Finally, we discussed timers and wait blocks. So if we wanna wait for a certain number of seconds, we use this top block here. So wait for a certain number of seconds. How also, if we want to just wait until the center button is pressed to debug or find errors in our program, we use this button here. And that's it. That's the complete flow control tab that we're going to discuss in the EV3 Classroom software. Now, if you have Spike, Prime, or the Robot Innovators program, uh, the programs are essentially identical. So you can use this information and apply it to your own programs. So that's it for this video. Um, I will repeat the fact that the flow control tab is the most important tab in EV3 classrooms, in my opinion, hands down. The reason being is we're going to use this flow control tab continuously, right? Um, we, want, we may want the robot to go straight forward and back. However, those are practical things we want to do. The flow control tab will allow us to control those blocks and make our lives a lot easier. And we'll also be able to do a lot more complicated things in the future. So if you feel like you're a little bit hazy on the knowledge that we covered, watch this video again. Ask questions in the comments and I'll try to get back to you. And that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.